Hey what's up everyone, Gave Productions here and today I'm going to be doing a long term review of the Samsung Galaxy Note 20 Ultra 5G Exynos Edition. That's a long name so for the rest of the video, I will be referring to this as the Note 20 Ultra. Let's cover the specs. Okay so the Galaxy Note 20 Ultra that I have here is the Exynos 990 variant of the Note 20 Ultra. There are two variants, the main difference between the two is simply the SoC or chipset of the phone. There is a Qualcomm Snapdragon 865 Plus variant and the Samsung Exynos 990 variant. I will dive into the differences between the two chipsets later. My Exynos Note 20 Ultra has 12GB of RAM and 256GB of onboard storage. This was the only option available here in Singapore. Globally, the Note 20 Ultra is available in multiple variants. There is an 8GB of RAM variant with 128GB of storage a 12GB of RAM variant with 256GB of storage like mine and a 12GB of RAM variant with 512GB of onboard storage. These variants are for the Exynos Note 20 Ultras. For the Snapdragon variants of the Note 20 Ultra that you can only find in the US or South Korea, there is an 8GB of RAM variant with 128GB of storage and 12GB of RAM with 512GB of storage. All Note 20 Ultras do come with expandable storage via a microSD card slot which you can put in the hybrid slot with the SIM. The SIM slot is hybrid which means that you can either fit two SIM cards inside or one SIM card and a microSD card. Speaking about SIM cards, all Note 20 Ultras are 5G compatible. This depends on whether your country's carriers support both 5G types or only either of the 5G types. Here in Singapore, I believe that all major carriers are planning to support both sub-6 and millimeter wave 5G. So the Note 20 Ultra and SG has both antennas for the sub-6 5G and a millimeter wave 5G for our Note 20 Ultras. Moving on to the more general specifications of the device, the Note 20 Ultra has a 3 camera system. It has a massive 108 megapixel primary wide camera, a 12 megapixel ultra wide camera, and a 12 megapixel periscope 5x optical zoom camera. There is also a laser autofocus system to help with the focusing of the 108 megapixel camera. There is a 10 megapixel hole punch cutout selfie camera on the front of the device. There is a really large 6.9 inch Quad HD Plus dynamic AMOLED display that supports 120Hz at 1080p. It is HDR10 Plus certified and it is covered with Corning's new Gorilla Glass Victus. There is a dual speaker system on this phone, one at the earpiece and one on the bottom of the phone. There is a USB-C port at the bottom of the phone as well which supports up to 25 watts of wired charging. The phone also supports 15 watts of wireless charging and 5 watts of reverse wireless power share. Speaking of power, there is a 4500mAh battery inside which sounds like a decent size but more on that later. Oh yeah, there is also an under display ultrasonic fingerprint sensor. And lastly, there is Bluetooth 5.0 and Wi-Fi 6 on board. The phone is also IP68 dust and water resistant. Let's get into my long term review of this phone. So I have so much to say about this phone. Let me first break it down to what I like about this phone and then I'll move on to what I disliked about this phone. Let's start with performance. The performance of the Note 20 Ultra is as you expect from Samsung's top of the line Note series phone. It is smooth and fast in opening apps and using them. Using this phone in a vacuum without knowing that the Note 20 Ultra Snapdragon version exists, this is a solid performing phone and it is definitely faster than last year's Note 10 Plus but not by a huge margin. I use my phone with the 120Hz mood on which means that I use the screen in 1080p. The 120Hz dynamic refresh rate definitely contributes to the phone feeling a lot more smooth than last year's and like many people, it has spoiled me. It is really hard to go back and use a 60Hz screen or a 60Hz phone after experiencing the amazing 120Hz. That of course means that I am limited to 1080p which means that the text and everything in general is not as sharp as it could be. But 1080p is still plenty sharp especially on a screen this size. I personally can notice the difference between 1080p and 4040p but not everybody can. From what I heard most people honestly may not be able to tell the differences unless they are really looking for it. The display is bright and vivid uh, and I set it to vivid mode. I like my colors to punch out. It is extremely bright even in broad daylight and I have no problem viewing this phone outdoors even on a normal afternoon here in Singapore. The 120Hz refresh rate has also contributed to one of the new features of this phone, which is decreased latency for S Pen writing. According to Samsung, the latency of the S Pen had decreased from 42 milliseconds on the Note 10 Plus to only 9 milliseconds for the new Note 20 Ultra. 
That is a really big difference and yeah, I can definitely tell that the latency has gone down by a lot. The gap between the line and your S Pen as you draw is now so small that you can no longer really notice it unless you stare at the pen as you're drawing. Of course, I must mention that this decreased latency was mostly attributed to hardware updates to the Note 20 Ultra itself and not the S Pen. The S Pen is pretty much identical to last year's Note 10 Plus to the point where you can take a Note 10 Plus S Pen and slot it into the Note 20 Ultra, and vice versa. Overall, it is an excellent upgrade to the Note 20 Ultra to finally have an S Pen that feels like a real writing instrument in terms of latency. I'll talk more about the S Pen later on. Moving on to the cameras, the Note 20 Ultra's cameras have performed excellently. Photos are bright and vibrant, and are far less saturated than Samsung Galaxy phones from years ago. I find the photos having an interesting balance between true to life and increased vibrancy. In general, the Galaxy Note 20 Ultra's photos are not as true to life as maybe an iPhone or a Google Pixel, but that's because Samsung tends to lean towards a more vibrant look and not so completely true to life. But that's not to say that the phone strays very far away from being true to life. As a whole, it's largely personal preference. For the mass consumer, these photos objectively are nicer to look at in many situations compared to a more uh, relatively dull look and more true to life look on an iPhone. I would say that I do not mind my photos looking a bit more vibrant because I mainly use my photos for social media, such as Instagram. In terms of quality of the cameras, in ample lighting, pictures are sharp for all three cameras. HDR works excellently on the main camera and really well as well for both the periscopic and ultra wide camera, but not as good as the main camera. In low light, I personally believe that Samsung's flagship phones take some of the most usable night or low light pictures. Details are largely preserved and color is also not too washed out, unlike some phones where either the background is too noisy, the foreground is too noisy, or the colors just look a bit too warm or too washed out, uh, the pictures in low light are pretty good. Of course, if you are shooting pictures in low light, I would recommend using the night mode as the pictures come out far better than in auto mode most of the time. There is a sacrifice though. In night mode, exposure time tends to be much longer than in auto mode, which means that you have to hold your phone steady for a much longer period. Uh, than if you're shooting in auto mode. But this does allow for the software to decrease the ISO of the photo which means that it will result in a sharper and more usable picture. In terms of video, the Note 20 Ultra is capable of up to 8K at 24fps. But please do not buy this phone for this feature. It is honestly not very useful because the sharpness of the video goes up but the overall quality of the video goes down. I personally believe that you should treat this video function like a proof of concept or a glimpse into the future of smartphone cameras and your opportunity to be part of the future, but not as something that I will use on the daily. In terms of standard 1080p video, the stabilization is excellent and colors are great. Dynamic range is not as good as when you take photos, but that is to be expected. I personally believe and from what I heard, iPhone videos are overall better in quality, uh, but the Note 20 Ultra is no slouch as well. What the Note 20 Ultra has that even an iPhone or some Android phones do not have is Pro Video. Pro Video basically gives you the option to manually control many of the video settings of the video in real time, which is really cool. You can record video in 1080p 60fps, but that is only limited to the main 108 megapixel camera. That goes for 4K as well. If you want to record 4K 60fps on all cameras, you're going to have to opt for the new S21 Ultra that just dropped. But that being said, the Note 20 Ultra's camera system is overall a beast and anyone buying this will not be disappointed in it for taking photos or videos. Now let's talk about build quality and how it's held out over the past 6 months or so. So I've been using this phone in a case for the most part and a screen protector as well. I only recently started trying to use this phone without a case for this review. So far I haven't noticed any scratches on the back frosted glass. There are scratches on the front glass screen protector I have installed along with some cracks. But other than that, this phone looks pretty much brand new. There are no scuff marks on the gigantic camera housing or the rest of the aluminium frame of the phone. However, as of shooting this video, I have dropped this phone once without a case. It slipped out of my pocket from my Adidas track pants onto the floor, so it wasn't really high because I was sitting down but there is now a very small scuff mark on the top right corner of the aluminium frame. So in terms of charging, 25W fast charging is excellent and what I think is the current sweet spot for most phones with a 5000mAh battery to 4000mAh battery. This is because although the Note 10 Plus did support 45W fast charging, there were reports that the phone will get pretty warm and anyways it decreases the longevity of your battery. 
Fast charging also works on the curve, which means that phones tend to fast charge up to a certain percentage before it starts to slow down. So for me, I like to fast charge using the inbox USB-C 25W charging brick to quickly get my phone from 50 to 60% in a matter of 10 minutes or so. In terms of wireless charging, I don't really use wireless charging a lot unless I am in the car, but 15W is pretty fast and is actually as fast as the previous wired fast charging standard on older Samsung phones like the S10. Reverse power share is slow and I would only recommend using it for smaller devices such as wireless earbuds or a smartwatch. Moving on to 5G, I don't have a lot to say about it because I don't have a 5G plan, but sometime last year in 2020, the three major carriers were testing out their 5G infrastructure and so I got a chance to try 5G on M1 even though I do not have a 5G plan. And it was pretty bad. The signal and stability was pretty weak on both sub-6 and millimeter wave 5G and speeds were generally even lower on 5G as compared to 4G which was a bummer. I don't think I have any footage or screenshots to show you but trust me, it wasn't a good experience and so I turned off 5G mode on my phone. I hope that 5G has probably improved by now but I, I have no idea. Other small things to note, the dual speakers are pretty good, they are loud and have a decent amount of detail in them. The multiple microphone array in this phone sounds really good as well. This is a test of the microphone. Uh, I am wearing a mask, so do take note of that. But all the things you've heard so far is mostly what I liked about the Note 20 Ultra 5G. But now let's move on to the main reason you would buy a Note, and that is the S Pen. So as I mentioned above, the main improvement about the S Pen experience is the reduced latency which is sweet. But other than that, the S Pen has largely remained unchanged from last year's. You still have screen of memo, you can still take memos in the Samsung Notes app, you can still use the S Pen as other position when drawing on screenshots or Insta stories. All the useful tricks of the S Pen that many Note users have grown to love are still around and improved due to that reduced latency. Air gestures are still around which is cool I guess. They work but I have a hard time trying to figure out why and when I would use them. The main Bluetooth and air gesture feature that I use from the S Pen is when I am taking remote photos. I can double press the S Pen button to switch between the front facing and rear facing camera and I can use air gestures to switch between the camera modes in the viewfinder. These two things are by far my favorite things that you can do with the S Pen air gestures. I'll never have to use an aqua timer ever again. At the end of the day, the S Pen is a pretty niche tool and the biggest reason that you should get a Note 20 Ultra today is because you really want the S Pen for whatever reason you use it for. I know the new S21 Ultra does come with S Pen support but as MKBHD had said, it really feels more like an optional accessory rather than one that was built specifically for the phone. The experience of using the S Pen is a lot more complete on the Note 20 Ultra than it is on the new S21 Ultra. Let's touch a bit on software experience before I move on to what I dislike about the Note 20 Ultra. Currently, my Note 20 Ultra is on Android 11 and One UI 3.0. Since its release, my Note 20 Ultra has had about 2-3 major and big updates with camera improvements, performance improvements and supposedly better improvements as well. In terms of software design, I know that not everyone is a fan of Samsung's One UI design, but trust me when I say this. This looks far better than what TouchWiz used to look like back in the days. I personally don't mind Samsung's UI design, and I like the extra functionalities that it comes with One UI, such as a swipe down from the home screen to bring down the notification tray, or Bixby routines which is actually pretty useful. The previous two software updates said that they were supposed to improve battery life, but I haven't really felt much of a difference. Alright, now with all that being said, I'm gonna dive into the things that I don't like about this phone. And they mostly have something to do with the Exynos 990 chip. So, some of you may have seen this coming, but yeah, I absolutely despise this chip. Everything about this chip is simply worse than its Snapdragon 865 and 865 Plus counterpart. It has been proven through many benchmarks and many side-by-side -side tests that the 990 is objectively worse than the 865 and 865 Plus. Even though they are both manufactured on the 7 nanometer process, the Exynos 990 performs worse than the 865, let alone the 865 Plus, which the American and South Korean Note 20 Ultras are using in every single way. Benchmarks show that the 990 falls behind in both single core and multi core performance of the 865 and the 990's Mali GPU also falls short of the A65's Adreno GPU by quite a bit. In real world performance, it has also been proven that the app loading times are consistently longer on the 990 than on the A65 for most apps. 
Apart from performance, chips also have this really important thing which may be overlooked sometimes. It is efficiency. The 990's efficiency is really just embarrassing next to the 865 and 865 Plus. What do I mean by this? Well, not only does the 990 fall behind the Snapdragons in terms of performance in almost every single way, but the battery life on the Exynos Note 20 Ultras are much worse than on the Snapdragon Note 20 Ultras. What this means is that if both chips were to output the same level of performance, the 990 would require much more power and energy to achieve that level of performance compared to the 865 and 865 Plus. Which is a double whammy because not only are you getting less performance on the Exynos Note 20 Ultra, but you are also getting less battery life. I don't know about you, but this is simply unacceptable to me. If performance was lower but battery life was the same, I could maybe close one eye, I would still be pretty mad. Or if battery life was lower but at least performance was the same, I would also maybe close an eye but I would still be pretty mad as well. But to have both worse performance and worse battery life is just baffling to me. So the Exynos Note 20 Ultra has overall worse performance by quite a large margin and worse battery life as well by a decent margin as well. Well, it gets worse from here. Due to the poor efficiency of the Exynos chip, the Exynos Note 20 Ultra is also considerably warmer while using it as compared to the Snapdragon Note 20 Ultra. This was more of an observation from people who owned both devices. From my personal experience, my Exynos Note 20 Ultra does get pretty warm from even doing lightweight tasks, which is worrying. And it does get quite hot when I'm doing heavier tasks, such as taking photos or playing games. Now, as much as it seems like I'm just hating on Exynos, let me just clarify something. Let's backtrack a few years. There was a time when Exynos actually used to outperform Snapdragon, where people wanted to buy an Exynos Galaxy phone rather than a Snapdragon Galaxy phone. This started roughly in 2015 with the launch of the Galaxy S6. The Exynos 7420 was shown to outperform the Snapdragon 808 chip and later the 810 in almost every single way, but except for gaming, I think. The Exynos was also considered far more efficient and cooler than the Snapdragon chip. This trend continued for a few years until the release of the Galaxy S10 where the Snapdragon chip started to outperform the Exynos chip. I'm personally a fan of more competition in the smartphone space, uh, especially with you know, manufacturing of chips. And so although I really dislike this generation of Exynos, I do hope that they find their footing and create an Exynos chip that can actually match up to the Snapdragon variant. And it seems from preliminary results that that may be the case. The Galaxy S21's Exynos 2100 was shown through benchmarks to be around the same level of performance as the Snapdragon 888, or even more powerful than the 888. However, what remains to be seen is the efficiency of the chip, which will ultimately determine battery life and heat generated from the device. Okay, moving away from this whole Exynos and Snapdragon drama, overall, this phone did get pretty warm many times, and battery life is mediocre on this phone. I usually find myself plugging this phone in every day about midday without fail. According to the device care app on my phone, I use between 130% to about 150% battery daily. Of course, it is to be noted that I am using the 120Hz 1080p mode on the display. With all that being said, what is my long-term review verdict of the Note 20 Ultra Exynos Edition? The Note 20 Ultra Exynos Edition is an expensive phone, but it is the only worth it S Pen phone that you can buy. I would recommend this phone to people who really love the S Pen experience and just want the best S Pen experience now without having to wait another 6 months for the Note 21 Ultra and if you have a bit of money to spare. I wouldn't recommend this phone if you don't see yourself really using the S Pen much, if not at all. And also because of the abysmal performance of the Exynos 990 chip. This phone should not cost more than the US version of this phone even if it's cost of tax because it is an inferior Note 20 Ultra in almost every single way to the point where it should almost be called another phone altogether. With the S21 series just released and the fact that they are pretty much 200 USD less across the board as compared to last year's S20 series, they should definitely be considered if you want to buy a phone as of right now and if you agree with all the reasons above as to why you should not buy the Note 20 Ultra Exynos. Anyways, that's been it. If you like this video, do give it a thumbs up and please subscribe as well as it really helps the channel out. Give it a thumbs down if you dislike the video and comment down below what I can improve on my videos and what you'd like to see next. I would also like to especially thank everyone who has subscribed to my channel so far and I really appreciate the support. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you in the next one.